particular charism of the institute as God's gift to the church. So we all know what is the charism. You all know the charism of your institute, your congregation. And this gift was given to a founder, Pasquale, Silvio Pasquale, as a gift to the entire church, which you are living today in your life as well as in your mission. We shall try to see about this charism in today's reflections. So charism, consecrated life, finds its expression in the charism of a religious institute. So that is the first aspect. So where do we find our consecrated life? Where does the consecrated life find its expression? Consecrated life finds its concrete expression in the charism of our religious institute. That's why if there is no charism, we can say there is no religious institute. So the consecrated life itself expresses itself in the charism of a religious institute. That's why we say there cannot be any genuine living of consecrated life without charism of a religious institute to which you belong. So you are a catechist sister and your life as a consecrated life, as a consecrated person is seen there in the charism of your institute. That's why we cannot live a genuine consecrated life without charism. See the importance of charism in our life as consecrated person. I'm reading from Lumen Gentium number 46. The Holy Spirit gives rise to the different charisms in the church. So it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit which gives rise to different charisms in the church. For what? So that the church can present Christ to believers and non-believers alike, portraying the face of Christ in contemplation on the mountain. So to one congregation, this charism is given. So that congregation portrays the face of Christ in contemplation on the mountain. Whereas to another congregation, another charism is given to another founder. What is that? Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God to the multitudes. So another charism. To another congregation, the Holy Spirit gives another charism. Jesus healing the sick. Healing the sick. To another congregation, another charism. Jesus converting sinners. To another congregation, Jesus' solicitude for youth, youth of Oslo, and his goodness to all men. So the Holy Spirit gives rise to different charism in the church. So that the church can present Christ to believers and non-believers alike, portraying the face of Christ in contemplation on the mountain, his proclamation of the kingdom of God to the multitudes, his healing the sick, his converting sinners, is solicitude for youth and goodness to all men. The same Holy Spirit calls individual persons to live this charism and form a religious family in the church. That's why I'm a clerician. I belong to a religious family of the clericians. You belong to another family, Catholic Sisters of St. Anne's. So the Holy Spirit not only gives rise to charism, but it also calls the individual to live this particular charism and to form a religious family in the church. Shall read another one from the church document. There is no religious life existing concretely by itself 
upon which is grafted the specific and particular charism of each institute as subordinate additions. So a religious life finds its manifestation through the charism. So charism is closely ring, linked with religious life. Indeed, our consecrated life blossoms in the charism of the institute. So we all have received the gift of being consecrated persons. And that gift blossoms, flowers in the charism of the institute. I read another church documents from Essential Elements, number 46, which says, the ongoing configuration to Christ comes about according to the charism and the provisions of the institute to which the religious belongs. So we become more and more like Christ. How? According to our charism, according to the provisions of the institute to which we belong. So each has its own spirit. I mean, each institute has its own spirit, its own character, its own purpose, its own tradition. And it is in accordance with these that the religious grow in the union with Christ. So as a clerician, I grow in my union with Christ according to the spirit, character, purpose, and tradition of my congregation. And you, as sisters of Cathy, sisters of St. Anne's, you grow in your union with Christ according to your own spirit, the spirit of your congregation the character, the purpose and tradition that the Holy Spirit gave to your founder and who transmitted to your congregation. And so that is the importance of charism. So you understand carefully, our religious life is manifest. We live our religious life through our charism. So religious life as such doesn't exist uh, individually. So religious life or a religious institute essentially is related with the charism. So we live our consecrated life by living the charism of our institute. Okay. So with this introduction, we come to the next uh, topic, charism of the congregation fostered in the church. So the charism that the Holy Spirit has given to a particular congregation is to be fostered, is to be promoted in the church. We don't bury our charism. The charism doesn't disappear with the death of our founder. No, it is continued, it is being continued by the members. The charism of the con congregation is also promoted and fostered in the church. So Vatican II invited, especially Perfecta Caritatis number two, invited the religious to return, to go back to the original spirit of their institute and to adapt to the changed conditions of our time. Understand? Two important aspects are there here. One is, you go back to the original spirit of your institute, and then you also adapt, you also change, do the modification of your charism. You don't have a new charism. You are not creating a new charism. It's the same charism, but it goes through adaptation according to the changed conditions of our time. The founder might have lived 200, 300, 400 years back in a particular situation, in a particular atmosphere, in a particular time. And now things have changed. We are living in different times. So the same charism has to go through adaptation to the changed condition so that our life becomes more relevant and meaningful. So authentic consecrated life calls for fidelity to the founder spirit and the sensitivity to the signs of the time. It's very important, hmm? two aspects. So if we want to live an authentic life. So you want to live as an authentic religious, as a catechist sisters of St. Duane's, and I want to live as an authentic clerician, then two important aspects I should keep in mind. One, 
I should be faithful to the spirit of my founder, Saint Anthony Mary Claire. And you all should be faithful to the spirit of your founder, Father Pasquale, uh, Father Silvio Pasquale. That is the first aspect. Secondly, being faithful to our founders, the spirit of our founders, we should also be sensitive to the signs of the time. So the times have changed. The needs have changed. So people have different needs now. And we should also be courageous enough, bold enough to adapt the adapt being faithful to the spirit of our founders to the signs of the time. So two things please keep in mind. Faithfulness to the founder spirit and sensitivity to the signs of the time. So the founding charism of an institute and its sound traditions are the proper ground in which a consecrated person gets rooted. Our root is that. Where is the root? The charism of our institute, the founding charism of our institute and the tradition. And so that's why it is very important that the members should know, should be aware of the founding charism of our institute and also the history, the traditions of our congregation. Because that is the root, that is the foundation on which we build our edifice of consecrated life. Another document, Michue Relaciones, says, the very charism of the founders appears as an experience of the spirit. So what the founder had was an experience of the spirit because it's a gift of the spirit. And that experience of the spirit is transmitted to the disciples for what? To be lived, safeguarded, deepened, and constantly developed. Constantly developed, what we call adapted by them in harmony with the body of Christ continually in the process of growth. So church is also changing according to the signs of the times. Our congregations are also changing according to the times of the time, according to the signs of the times. So being faithful to the spirit of our founders, we also change, we also modify, we also adapt, we also develop the charism so that we are able to be sensitive to the needs of the modern process. So I read once again. Yes, it's very important. Huh? So the very charism of the founders appears as an experience of the spirit. And he doesn't keep, only the founder doesn't keep the charism only for himself or herself. But it is transmitted to whom? To his or her disciples. For what? To be lived. To be safeguarded. To be deepened and constantly developed by them always hmm, in harmony with the body of Christ because our vocation is an ecclesiastical vocation. We are not away from the church. We are within the church, very much within the church. So we are in harmony with the body of Christ, which is continuously, continuously in the process of growth. Then Lumen Gensium says, it is for this reason that the distinctive character of various religious institutes is preserved and fostered by the church. So it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And each gift is special, distinct. So the charism of your founder, your congregation, is different from the charism that our founder received. So each charism is unique. Each charism is special. Each charism is new. Each charism is distinctive. And that distinctness, distinctiveness, that distinctive character of various religious institutes must be preserved and fostered by the church. What is that? I suppose. 
spoke you i spoke about distinctive character what is that distinctive character this distinctive character also involves a particular style of sanctification you see life of holiness the way you live your holiness the way you live your life as kathy's sister the way i live my life as a clerician my life of holiness and the apostolate the ministries that we do the ministries that you do the ministry that we do which creates its particular tradition so the tradition is from these two the particular lifestyle of sanctification of the members and the mission or the apostolate that the members do create in its its particular tradition with a result that no one can readily perceive that one can readily perceive its objective element so seeing our lifestyle seeing our ministry somebody or one is able to see what is the objective of our life now come very important aspect integrating personal gift within the charism of the institute so in other words personal charism and the charism of the institute so each one of us is gifted we all have god's gifts the holy spirit gives us different gifts and then our congregation our institute has also its own gift how are we going to integrate both is there conflict between my personal charism and the congregational charism or can there be conflicts sometime no some people say ah my charism is not compatible with the charism of the congregation i have received so many charism so many gifts and uh, my congregation is not recognizing those gifts those charism they are not allowing me to live my charism to manifest my charism so i find that i am like a fish out of water in this charism that can be sometime these type of conflicts between the personal charism and the congregation charism this is very important subject dear sisters to be aware can there be first of all because there are some religious who feel that the congregation is not respecting that personal charism we shall try to see what it means so individual religious certainly possess personal gifts which we call the gifts of the holy spirit charism which without doubt usually come from the spirit because it is the holy spirit which gives charism it is the holy spirit which gives gifts and we know there are different gifts and we all as individuals we are also endowed with the gifts now understand comes very important point they are intended I mean, these personal gifts, personal charism. So you may be a good singer, singing. You know to praise God. You are a healer. You know to heal. You are a preacher. You are able to preach. You are a teacher. You are able to teach well. So these gifts, teaching, preaching, healing, all these leadership, uh, all these gifts are intended for the enrichment, development. and rejuvenation of the life of the institute understand very very important all these gifts are given to us by the holy spirit for what to enrich our congregation to develop our congregation to rejuvenate our congregation the life and the mission of the congregation understand in the unity of the community not fighting with the community members and then you want to enrich your congregation no you can never do you can never enrich your congregation you are develop your congregation rejuvenate your congregation when you are not able to be a good community member you fight with all the members in the community with the superior all the time fight you don't come for community prayers you don't come for community meals you don't come for other community activities and then you say god has given me so many gifts charism and the god wants me to develop my congregation no not possible that's it's clearly said 
these gifts are given for the enrichment development and rejuvenation of the institute always in the unity of the community uh, as good community member and in giving proof of renewal again mutual relationes that document again says discernment of such gifts discernment of such gifts that gifts that we have received we are speaking about personal gifts not the congregation charism but personal charism however and the correct use will be measured how will you know that you have re really received these gifts from the holy spirit how will we know that you are making use of these gifts in a proper way will be measured according to the consistency the members show both within the community commitment of the institute and with the needs of the church as judged by legitimate authority very interesting so this so these criteria are very important how do we know that your gifts are from the holy spirit and how do we know that you are use making use of these gifts in a proper way is this the consistency that you show in your community commitment that's what i said you cannot be someone saying that god has given me so much of gift and i am using it for the congregation if you have problem with the community if you are not there for community commitments what i meant community prayers community meals other community activities community recreation good relationship rapport with the community members that is important that is what you show that these gifts are you are the gifts that the holy spirit has given is made use in a proper way and with the needs of the church you, know, you are also there at the service of the church as judged by legitimate authority as judged by your superior as judged by your uh, provincial or uh, as judged by the uh, general not as judged by your friend you may say you see that priest is saying that uh, uh, these are gifts that god has given me no how are you judged by your congregational legitimate authority you cannot fight with a superior with a provincial with a general saying that god has given me this gift this charism and the congregation is not uh, accepting not recognizing and so on just a few more aspect in this so that cannot be any dichotomy you know, understand carefully that cannot be any dichotomy that cannot be any conflict regarding charism and mission between that of an individual religious and the institute you cannot have charism conflict like this individuals and the, and the charism of the institute but rather an individual religious finds fulfillment and realization of his life and mission within the charism and mission of the institute so we have received a lot of gifts and those gifts find its their fulfillment and realization in the life and mission within the charism and mission of the institute you cannot find its fulfillment outside the life and mission of the congregation but now we are coming to the uh, next uh, one important aspect but there are there are honest religious finding what we call a vocation within the vocation to consecrate life when they discover a personal call what we call call within the call to respond to the need of the church which cannot be met by their respective institute see understand this carefully don't misunderstand we are going to the next level we said our personal charism has to be manifested lived within the charism of our institute that's a normal thing but there are sometimes exceptions where an honest religious finds or receives a vocation within his vocation her vocation to consecrate life when he or she discovers a personal call or what we call a call within the call she discovers a call within the call to respond to the need of the church yeah, understand need of the church not for her own needs but to uh, to respond to the need of the church which cannot be met by the respective institution i 
uh, given the example of Mother Teresa. So Mother Teresa was already a Loreto sister. And there she received a vocation within the vocation. Yeah, another call to respond to the need of the church of that time, you know, of the last century, especially to take care of the poor, needy, marginalized as well. And then she understood that these needs cannot be met in her own institute, Loreto Congregation. So she leaves that order and she establishes another congregation with its own cancer. So it could be, it could be that the Holy Spirit coaches or trains a person in an institute like Maya Teresa was coached, trained as a Loreto sister to become a recipient of a particular gift, particular charism for the life of the church. So you understand, you are in a particular congregation where the Holy Spirit trains you, coaches you. And you become a recipient of a particular gift for the life of the church. I know also there are a few clericians who have founded also congregations. You may also know many other fathers and you know, sisters, they, are, they were religious in a particular congregation, but then they want to respond to a particular need of the church and they become founders. Now, how do you know that it is really from God? How do you know this vocation is really from God? How do you know that this gift or this charism is from the Holy Spirit? We have to follow the Gamaliel principle. You know the Gamaliel principle? Acts 5.39, where Gamaliel says, If it is from God, no human being can stop. If it is from God, no human being can stop it. The vocation that Mother Teresa received, being a Loreto sister, is from God. That's why it could not be stopped. It is only flourished, continued to flourish. Same thing. So if it is from God, this cannot be stopped. But it is only from human being. After a few years, it will die by itself. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. If it is from God, it will flourish. If it is not from God, within a few years, or at least with the death of that particular person, the congregation or his or her initiative will also die. So the Gamalian principle is the best measure for the authenticity, genuineness, of a newly sprouting religious institute through a member of another institute. So it should be distinguished, uh, understand, it should be distinguished from the sprouting of religious congregations founded mostly for women by some religious and many bishops without serious discernment. I'm not speaking about this, I'm speaking about genuine gift received by someone like my Teresa. But you know, there are also cases of many religious congregations like mushroom, simply sprouting, mainly founded for women by some religious or also sometimes bishops without serious discernment. And today, you know, Pope Francis is very serious about this. That's why he has changed, uh, he has amended the canon law by which it is now very, very difficult for uh, bishops to give permissions. You know how the congregations are founded, no? In the beginning, it always begins like a pious association. So, you know, so some 5, 10, 15 people, they come together, they live a particular mm, a life of piety, penance, uh, and so on. And then what they do, they uh, approach a bishop, and then bishop gives uh, permission. And then previously it was written that bishop has to consult Vatican before giving permission or to erect them as a diocese and right, the bishop has to consult Vatican. But sometimes what happened, there were cases that bishops, even without consulting or without getting, they may inform the bishop, uh, Vatican, but without getting their feedback and all, they give permission. But now Pope Francis, I think last year, I think, uh, the previous year, he made it very clear, uh, last year, last December, he made it very clear 
that bishops should get written permission from Vatican. Only after that they can give permission. Written permission from Vatican. So even yesterday, uh, Pope Francis was speaking with the members of the Congregation for the Institutes of Consecrated Life and the Societies of Apostolic Life, where he speaks about this. Yesterday I just uh, read a small article where he says, that we have to be extremely careful with these type of sprouting of religious congregation without proper discernment, without really receiving special gift from the, from the Holy Spirit. So that I'm not speaking about this. What I meant was uh, the real authentic gift that a particular member receives from God. Okay. Now, another very interesting or important aspect, vibrating the charism, charism of the founder in your life. So, founder lived, let us say, centuries back or years back. As a member of that particular congregation, how are you vibrating the charism of your founder? So, there are people who join a religious institute after prolonged contact with it and a serious discernment about one's call to that institute. For example, some of you might have studied in your own institute. So you know your sisters for a long time. You already know about the founder, Silvio Pasquale. You know the apostolate, the missed life, uh, the holiness, sanctification, so on. After knowing everything, you join the college. But this is very rare. But large number of us, what we do, large number of occasions, we join an institute by sheer coincidence. We do not know or due mere circumstances without knowing much about its charism. And when I join, I do not know even what does it mean by charism. I do not know what does it mean by charism. Or even I do not know that there is a difference between diocesan priest and religious priest. Even that I did not know. And many of you may be like that. When you join, you might have never heard before joining about Silvio Pasquale. You never heard. I never heard about St. Anthony Mary Clara before joining the Claritian Congress. I never heard. At least some saints are very famous, like Francis of Assisi, Clara, you all know, or uh, Ignatius Loyola. But our founder was that time, nobody knows. I mean, nobody in the sense. I, I was not aware. And Silvio Pasquale, many of you may not be aware at all before joining. So many of us simply we join. And many of us will be like that. But, but, Beneath it, even though we are not aware, beneath it, that could be the mysterious guidance of the Holy Spirit who draws people to where they belong. So there must have been the mysterious guidance of the Holy Spirit who wants me to be a clerician. Certainly, there would be a mysterious guidance of the Holy Spirit for you to be sisters of St. Anne's. So, Katy, sisters of St. Anne's, you may think by chance I came, by sheer coincidence I joined, mere circumstances brought me here. But beneath that, though we may not be aware, there must be something. There must be a mysterious guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you know whether your own unique vocation and mission finds its fulfillment in the charism of the Institute? So, even without knowing, we have joined. We have joined. But now, how do we know that my own vocation, my unique vocation, my unique mission find its fulfillment in the charism of my institute. Your heart will know. Your heart will know. You cannot explain with your reason, but your heart will know whether you are called to an institute by experiential validation through your living of your charismatic values, your personal encounter with the Holy Spirit, uh, with the spirit of the founder, and knowing its history. You know, I now, as I said, when I joined, I did not know about cleric. I had never heard about clericians. I do not know all these differences and so on. But today, if you ask me, I will say I'm very happy to be a clerician. And I find this is my life. This is where God wanted me to be. I studied in a Jesuit school. So I know about Jesuits. Even you know, uh, when I see some of the Jesuits, I used to admire so much. And even my most of my studies I did in Jesuits, but still I am proud to be a clerician. And this is what gives me happiness, this is what gives me joy. The heart of the heart, I know that this is where I belong to. So all of you, 
though you might have joined without knowing much about your congregation now your heart will know whether you are called to this particular institute by your lifestyle by your happiness by your commitment by your love for your founder love for your congregation for the tradition of the congregation and also for the sisters who are living with you eventually you will find what we call the inner harmony inner harmony between your heart's longing and the charismatic thrust of an institute of your institute and you become convinced that you have found the place for your soul to blossom so eventually you will find there is an inner harmony between your longing your personal longing and the charismatic thrust of your institute even when community infidelities even when we have problems in the communities in the congregations even when we have community infidelity such as power politics in the institute domestication of its property spirit by opting for uh, worldly values some type of group fights based on race caste and regional differences etc threaten the validity of the institute and sometimes make you sad make you angry and so on you still remain convinced of your vocation within the institute this is what it is you love your congregants you love your founder so when we have these type of problems you know fighting politics and then when we become more and more worldly and then you know we have groupism casteism regionalism this and that you sometimes become very angry you become very sad sometimes you become very upset but you don't feel like you leaving the congregants you understand this is your family it's your mother and then you continue to be convinced that this is where i remain this is where you find the joy you find your satisfaction in spite of these type of you know human weaknesses create some type of problems but when you have prolonged experience of inner disharmony speaking i am now coming very practical levels but when you have prolonged the experience of inner disharmony between your spiritual longing and the spirit of congregation in spite of good community experience and acceptance in the institute you are in a wrong place okay. so you have a prolonged experience of dissatisfaction inner disharmony all the time sadness all the time frustration all the time disappointment some conflict you have you always feel that you don't belong to this congregation or this way of life in spite of good community life is a good community experience people are good to you you feel you are being accepted recognized in the church in the institute they gave you sufficient opportunities to blossom to grow but yet you continuously you suffer there is a prolonged experience of inner discord harmony maybe you are in a wrong place so you are wasting your time and energy to push yourself to fit in because one day you will have give up or you may unhappily nest in the institute so if you have this type of prolonged experience of inner disharmony you are wasting your time because one day you may go out you may give up this life or you may become a mediocre you live unhappily nest in the institute in a way just like a nester contributing nothing to the congregation hence it is important to arrive at an inner clarity before one proceeds to make final vows in an institute so we have to be extremely careful before making our final profession we should reach that inner clarity we should be convinced that this is the place where i belong to this is the congregation this is the institute where god wants me to contribute to the church so it is very important to have that inner clarity so this inner disharmony is of a different order 
you understand eh? what i'm speaking about this uh, you know prolonged experience of inner disharmony is of different order than the pains of frustrated desires and ego needs or sometimes the interpersonal conflicts that we'll have for example you are given a transfer to a place where you don't like natural that you may go through some type of frustration disappointment or you have some type of tensions with the superior some community problems you don't they like your superior you feel that the superior doesn't recognize you these are all natural things which are pangs of or pains of your maturing process so i'm not speaking about this so this inner disharmony which i said is a prolonged experience where you really feel that you don't belong you don't you don't fit into this institute but there is other thing hmm, the frustration disappointment some type of sadness some type of conflicts interpersonal all that we will have in our religious life not only in our religious life in any life even in married life there are problems there are difficulties but they are all process they are all process of our growth process of our maturation some naive religious have foolishly abandoned the religious life due to petty tensions uh, with the superiors some problem with the transfer so you leave the congregation some problem with uh, let us say with the superior you leave the congregation or some normal age related struggles of leaving the evangelical councils so when you are young you may have more craving for things you want to enjoy the worldly things and then the congregation doesn't allow so you think okay if i go allow out i can use the mobile that i want i can use type of dress that i want i can be with the gold chain these and so on can happen or also when you are in your teenage or in your 20s or 30s you may have more struggles with regard to power of chastity you have more sexual desires excitement and then i think ah this is not a way for me and then you simply leave later you regret so i am not speaking about this okay this can happen these type of normal struggles and then sometimes some uh, religious they simply throw away the gift of vocation now creative fidelity to the charism of the institute creative fidelity faithfulness but what type of faithfulness creative fidelity so creative fidelity to the charism demands vigilance of the spirit which calls for following for the following okay so creative fidelity means we need vigilance to the spirit we have to be open to the promptings of the spirit which will happen when we have these following things what a continual examination regarding fidelity to the lord and docility to his spirit intelligent attention to the circumstances the situation and an outlook cautiously directed to the signs of the time you always open your eyes see what is the signs of the time what are the circumstances how i can express the charism of my institute in this particular circumstance in this particular signs of the time the will to be part of the church and the awareness of subordination to the sacred hierarchy so always be uh, convinced that you are part of the church you are not out of the church so be open to the church needs and also always be aware that we have the vow of obedience we have to be subordinate to our hierarchy boldness of initiatives constancy in giving of self humility in bearing with adversities with uh, oppositions with misunderstanding with uh, frustrations disappointments and so on so it is the discovery of living contact with the founding charism and its sound traditions that can engender love and fidelity to the charism of the founder and be embraced it as an experience of the spirit to be lived safeguarded deepened and constantly developed which we already explained so the charismatic identity is the basis for the maturity of the members so charismatic identity that i belong to this congregation this tradition of this congregation this charism that the founder received so that charismatic identity is the basis for the maturity of the members in order to live and work in conformity with the foundational charism and for the identity and unity of the institute so in the life of a charism of a consecrated person 
her charismatic identity progressively becomes the organizing principle of one's entire existence and deep motivation for her life and apostolic life. So more and more, we are aware of our charism. More and more, we enjoy our charismatic identity. We grow and that our whole existence depends on that and that we become deeply motivated in our life and mission. And now, another one important aspect, uniqueness of charism of institute in relation to similar charism. So you may wonder how various charisms are different from each other when religious institutes carry out the same kind of apostolate and living similar style of life. For example, you, are, you have your own prayer life, and you know your own missions, you have maybe you know, schools, colleges, some clinics, some social centers, and so on. And you see even another congregation, they also have like you, morning prayer, they have evening prayer, they have rosary, they have adoration, they have monthly recollection, they have retreat, all that you do, they are also doing. And you have schools, they also have schools. You have colleges, they also have colleges. You have some social centers, they also have social centers. You run one world age home, they also run one world age what is that unique in my congregation? What is the uniqueness of the charism of my institute? So sometimes it may look that we are all same. And though the names are different, we have same type of life. They also have the same type of life. We do same type of ministry. They also do same type of ministry. What is that uniqueness? To understand perhaps an analogy to the human person may explain the similarity and differences of charism better. So when you look at a person, see, you see me and you see some another person, we all look the same in the sense we have the same, all of us have eyes, all of us have nose, all of us have hands, all of us have legs, so all of us are uh, walking straight. So you look, we all look like a similar person, the same physical features are there. And we also do the similar activities like we all eat, we all drink, we all work, we all walk, we all run. So we also do the same activities. But, you know, each person is different. Each person is unique. Each person is distinct because of her unique self, which imprints the unique character to all that a person has. You see, I am not you. You are not me. So Robin is different from Teresa. Or Robin is different from Joseph. We may look the same. We have so many eyes. So we have, both of us have eyes, nose, hands, legs. We all eat, drink, and so on. But each one person is unique, distinct. That is how we have to understand. So each institute has its uniqueness. How? As expressed in its spirituality, which is manifested in the life of the founder and the historical journey of the institute. So what is that uniqueness? That is the unique spirit of the Institute. The unique spirit that the Holy Spirit gave to your founder. That is the uniqueness. That is the unique spirit of the Institute. So each charism uniquely manifests Christ's life and mission by highlighting some aspect of it in the church and in the world. So this is where uniqueness is. Okay. So each charism uniquely manifests Christ's life and mission by highlighting some aspect of it in the church and in the world. We may fail sometimes to capture this uniqueness if we merely compare only the ministries done by the institute. You see, they are running school, we are also running school. They are running hospital, we are running hospital. They have an orphanage, I all, we also have an orphanage. They have one old age home, we also have one old If you think only these activities, what we call ministries, apostolate, and then you try to compare one institute with another institute, you will, find, you will fail to capture this uniqueness. So that uniqueness has to be seen in the life, in the tradition of the congregation. Here, no, in our institute, we have people from different congregations. So when they are there, when they, especially when they come as a group, very easily we can find, uh, very easily we can, okay, this congregation, they have their own tradition. They have their own uniqueness. Very easy to find out. Whereas another congregation, the way the, the, the students, the sisters, 
the way they behave, the way they relate, the way we, they speak, the way they conduct prayers, the way they participate in the prayer activities, immediately we are able to see, okay, they have another uniqueness, another tradition. So, don't compare just to ministry. That is only one part of it. But more than that, we have uniqueness, uniqueness of the spirit, unique spirit of the institute. Okay, finally, before we come to the practical thing, charism and the founder's life. The founder is chosen by the Holy Spirit to gift a particular charism to the church. So in your case, Father Pasquale was specially chosen by the Holy Spirit to give a particular charism to the church. And his life is a living witness of the gift that is received. So the way he lived is a witness to the gift that he received. So we have myriads of saintly witnesses of charismatic gifts in the church. You see these saints, we can immediately you can see that they have received that gifts. But understand, the founder has no gift of infallibility. We cannot say that the founder will never make mistakes. No, he has not received the gift of infallibility. And hence, he or she, like any other human, can also sometimes overcome by sin, greed, and inordinate affections. Problems can start with the founder itself. And I was speaking, you know, yesterday, Father, I mean, Bishop Pope Francis was speaking to the members of the Congregation for the Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life, where he speaks about this. He speaks about the founders making mistakes. Yeah. So he's speaking about that, uh, that possibility that the founder himself or herself sometimes can fall. There, are, there was a recent case of a founder whose abusive and irresponsible sexual behavior have caused public scandal. And I know also when I was in Africa, there was one uh, father, one founder, not exactly, it was not I think recognized, but something like a secular institute he was having with many girls, young girls. And I know that he was also abusing some girls. So founders can also make mistakes. There was another foundress. That foundress left the institute that she had founded in order to marry one another religious who was like a mentor. You see? Foundress leaving the congregation and marrying another religious happens. But both these institutes seem to continue with vitality, despite that initial shock and pain to its members. So the founders have made some mistakes. They left the congregation. But the institute continued to grow because it is the gift of the Holy Spirit given to the church. Okay, so it goes. So these events affirm that the role of the Holy Spirit as the real protagonist of the charism of an institute, not the founder, the real protagonist. The real protagonist is the Holy Spirit. So as we saw Kamalian principle, if it really comes from God, nothing can stop it, even when the founders or foundresses fail. So certainly, collective and continuous infidelities to the charism is extinction. Because the charism is the only reason for an institute to exist in the church. If charism is not faithfully followed, so continuous infidelities to the charism, and there is no prophetic spirit, vigor is there, is not there, then the institute will slowly die. And that's why we have to be continuously faithful to the charism. If the members are not at all faithful to the charism of the institute, if there is no prophetic spirit, that congregation will die soon. So the best homage that you can pay to your religious institute is to seek joyfully to live its charism and creatively carry out its mission as fulfillment of your own vocation and mission. So this is the best thing that you can do. You love your founder. You love your congregation. What is the best contribution that you can make to your founder? Best gift that you can give to your founder? Best gift that you can give to your congregation, which has done so much for you, is this. So the best homage or the best 
gift that you can give to your religious institute is this to seek to joyfully live its charism so you live your charism joyfully and creatively carry out its mission wherever you are appointed whatever may be the mission that you are interested with so creatively carry it out as fulfillment of your own vocation and mission now i am giving you one small exercise so as you reflect this following story you are invited to apply i invite you to apply its challenges to your own personal story your own personal life and of your own religious institute and check the initial spirit the spirit of father pasquale and its consequent changes which may have taken place all these years in your congregation for better or for worse so changes must take their changes is the change is only thing that is constant change should take place according to the signs of the time but the changes have taken place for better or for worse okay so this is a small story it's a very interesting story to reflect about our charism so i invite you to listen very carefully to this story i will just read the story only because story is a very clear as need by the explanation and then apply that is important apply this story to your own personal story and the story of your congregation and that's just to see are you so faithful to the founding spirit the spirit the charism of father silvio pasquale and the changes that have taken place all these years have they for better of the congregation or for worse so this is a story of shipwreck saving center shipwreck saving center so there was a dangerous sea where several shipwrecks used to happen and many people used to die so powerful waves will carry all these dead bodies of these people who were Uh, caught up in these shipwrecks, and at times dying persons to the shore. So some dead bodies will come, some persons will come off dead, and so on. Seeing these victims, you know, dead people or some people dying people on the shore because of shipwrecks, one poor fisherman, so like a founder, you no, know, a poor fisherman was inspired. to risk his life to save these people so this poor fisherman thought i must go and save these people who are there in the sea affected by shipwreck so what he did he went with his small boat he had a small boat he went with his small boat to the sea to save these victims of shipwrecks so risking his own life he saved several men from drowning hearing about this about this story of this poor fisherman one man trying to save so many people many people joined him and then some rich women what they did they could not join in this saving but they gave lot of money so that this poor man can buy a better boat a modern boat to save these people who were affected by shipwreck then many volunteers came to feed the victims so when the victims the wounded people were brought to the shore many volunteers also joined to feed those victims to nurse their wounds to bandage them to help them and so on then what they did they need a place to keep these wounded people so they built in the beginning there was no structure nothing was there only boat was there now they built one shed to take care of the victims so they brought the people to that shed where they were fed and where their wounds were all uh, uh, nursed then some volunteers they lost their lives during their mission okay so some of the volunteers also died when they went to the sea to save them some of them also died there during their mission but lots of lives were saved so by their sacrifice many people were saved and the fisherman the first man no, who started all these activities he also died after some time so news spread about the sacrifices of this fisherman and his boatman so news went here and there one man who lived like that saved so many lives and then now he died so people were inspired by hearing this story this example of this fisherman poor fisherman and his companions 
who risked their lives and saved so many people. So more money came to support this mission and more volunteers also stepped in. Then they bought even a small ship. So from both, now they bought a small ship for advanced service. And then they built also a bigger building. In the beginning, they are only a shed. Now they built a bigger building for the volunteers to stay. And then many volunteers came. So additional houses were made also for other volunteers, also to give training, formation. So give training to the new recruits. So then they told, okay, we need a, a training and we need also some recreational activities. So to meet the recreational and health needs of these volunteers, not those who are in the sea, not the shipwrecked people, but those who are the volunteers, so recreational health needs of the volunteers, they built a modern gym, a good stadium was built, and even a mini theater was, were added. And then efficient personnel were set apart for administration. Because we need administration, because so many volunteers are there. So all those who are talented, efficient, they were set apart for administration and maintenance of the center. And only few are willing to go to the sea. So many wanted to be like administrator. Many wanted to be here in this main building to maintain it. And to the mission of saving people, only very, very few were willing to go to the sea. So the leadership had to hire personnel to go to the sea because they could not get people. So they have to hire some fishermen to go to the sea and rescue some people to keep the mission going and collect money to meet the growing needs of the institution. One day, one fellow, when some people were badly affected victims, I mean the shipwreck, they were brought into the house by a hired man. The marble floor of the mansion was dirty. So they all have a nice building, good building with nice mosaic floor or with the granite or marble. And these people who were brought by the by the volunteers, those victims, they were put there. And some got angry. Oh, this nice building is being now damaged, being dirtied by these uh, people you have brought from the sea. So annoyed at this, they built a temporary shed for the victim. So they again built one small shed, temporary shed. And these temporary shed, these people were kept. And in this nice building, these so-called missionaries, they were all staying. So life at the center became yogurant with birthday parties, feasts, and then some entertainment program, and some dancing, some singing, some drinking to lift the drooping spirit of the members. So one of the members in that time remembered the great founder, that fisherman, that symbol fellow, his symbol lifestyle with a small boat and the original spirit of the mission that that man had and then he began these ministries. So that man, he began to question the analogy of the situation, an anomaly of the situation. He said, how is it? How we started our mission? How, where have we ended up now? But he was pruned. He was ridiculed. He was attacked. And finally, he was kicked out of the organization for disobedience. He got a little boat and he went to the sea in his own way to save the people. Seeing his sacrifice, some others also joined. And as years went by, there arose many shipwreck saving centers here and there with some beautiful building and then also some little sheds here and there all along the sea. So, okay. So this is a story. And then uh, as you are in recollection, I ask you just sit and reflect about this story and then try to relate this story with your own life, with the life of your institute, how your institute began with Father Silvio Pasquale, what was the situation, what was his intention, how he received that charism, how faithfully he carried out his charism, that charism, and how those pioneer sisters who joined him, how they were, how they lived, how they carried out their mission, and then the stage where you have now received, where you have reached with a lot of buildings, a lot of institutions, a lot of members. And then you see what is the relationship, whether you are growing, carrying out faithfully the spirit of your founder, or 
you have reached in some another mm, level. So some points to ponder, mm, and then ask also these four questions. Four questions. First question: Have you ever fine-tuned your inner spirit with that of your congregational spirit? Mm? So harmony between your inner spirit with that of your congregational spirit. Or do you still have this type of struggle between your personal charism and the charism of your congregation? How consistent is your life with the ideals of consecrated life and the charism of your institute? Consistency. How consistent is your life with the ideals of consecrated life and the charism of your institute? Third question, how does the present state of your institute express its founding ideas and charism? So today's situation, compared with the gift that Pasquale, Father Silvio Pasquale received, how does the present state of your institute express its founding ideas and charism? The last question, what is your contribution to keep alive and creatively update, adapt the charism of your religious institute? What is your contribution? What are you doing? How are you contributing to keep alive and creatively update the charism of your religious institute? Okay.